let us call one another to worship today using the words of Revelation 4 and 5 printed in your bulletin. Would you please stand as you are able? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they have been created. You are worthy, Lamb of God, to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise.
we are here to adore you this morning, and we know that our words just fall short of your glory, of your wonder, of your kindness, of your mercy to us again and again. And most ultimately, Lord, through the sending of your Son, Lord, you are so high and far above us. You are all power, you are all glory, you are all justice, you are all things that are good, and you have loved us from the beginning. Lord, we are so grateful this morning as we gaze on your beauty together, as we gaze on what is happening at your throne, as we gaze on our future of praising you. Lord, we join in the praise and glory of your name in just this little taste of all that you are. And Lord, together we come together to pray the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have peace with God through Christ. It is a marvelous mystery. And also because we have peace, through Christ, we have peace with one another. So now let us share signs of that peace. Well, good morning again. Uh, welcome to all of you, whether you are worshiping with us in person, whether you are worshiping with us online. We are so happy to have you with us this Labor Day weekend. Uh, if you are new to worshiping with us and you would like to get more connected, in the pews in front of you, there is a little card that you can fill out. And we would love to have you fill that out and tell us a little bit more about yourself so that we can reach out to you. Last week, we, if you were here, we talked about intentional communities and we're all about trying to get people connected in one way or another. And that might be a more traditional small group or Bible study. It might be the gardening group. It might be the facilities team. So we would just love to have you get more connected. Uh, one of those ways to get you more connected is tonight. Uh, the Perkins are having an end of the summer cookout at their home, and they would love to have you. Uh, hopefully you already signed up, but if you didn't, you are still welcome, right, Chris? Plenty of food. There's plenty of food, so we would love to have you for that. Um, that is this evening at 5. Uh, so <laughs> I'd love to have you. Uh, then and there, if you need the address, uh, just ask one of us and we, can get, we would be more than happy to help you get there. Also be on the lookout next week. Uh, we are having our kickoff Sunday. That means that we are starting a bunch of new things. The choir will be singing uh, for the first time in a little while because they have had a bit of a break this summer, a well-deserved break. We will be starting some new Sunday classes. For adults, we will be having a class. The fellowshipping class is going to be continuing their study on Proverbs. The, uh, there is going to be a class on the book of John uh, that will be led by Richard Draffin and Michael Jackson. And there will be a class on parenting that will be led by the Marxes and others. So don't miss out on those new opportunities that will be starting next week. We would love to have you be a part of all of the things going on in our church 
And to do so, please uh, take note of the other opportunities that are in your bulletin because there are many that are starting up uh, this time of year. Now I would like to invite the children to come up and have a word with Pastor Chris. If you're 50 or 60 and consider yourself a child, you're welcome to come too, but that's, there's a few, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'm wondering, have any of you ever met a, a famous person? I, I, I haven't met too many famous people. Is they, who'd you meet? You. Oh, me, yes, oh, yes, Will. Thank you, thank you. Says my daughter, with a sarcastic grin on her face. Uh, anyone else? Anyone ever meet a famous person? I, I haven't really met too many famous people in my life either. I remember meeting Bobby Clark. He was a hockey player for the Philadelphia Flyers, but I didn't actually even know I met him until he left. Uh, and uh, I met—I I had uh, dinner with John Piper. Is, is that? Is, do you know? Is that fun? You, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, I met Captain Kangaroo. You probably don't know who he is. <laughs> But back then, he, he was all that. He was, uh, you know, he, 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 was, a, he was a guy. Uh, but he, what do you do when you meet somebody famous? Uh, yeah, you actually kind of, you can kind of get nervous and all that. Uh, has anyone ever met a king? Uh, yeah? Who? Jesus. Oh, you met King Jesus. That's, that's, that's what we want to actually talk about today. But there's actually not a whole lot of kings left to run into, right? We have King Charles, might be the closest one you might run into at some point. I did have a friend who met uh, Queen uh, uh, Elizabeth. Um, but let, let me show you a picture. This is when kings were all over the place. It's kind of hard to see. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but th there's, there's one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people in that picture. Can anyone guess which one is the king? Who do you think is the king? Point to him. Let's see. That one. How, who do you think is the king over here? You think that one too? What? How could you tell? You can hardly. This is, this is, this is a, an Assyrian king from like uh, 800 BC or something. How did you know that was the king? Why? Yeah. Like serving yes, that's right. Everybody is facing that king, aren't they? It doesn't matter what side you're on, you're facing the king. And, and what do they have in their hands? Lindsay Jane said they have stuff in their hands. You know, and, and they're, they're feeding him. They're, they're taking care of him. Here's, here's another picture of a king from the same kind of time period. This king's, I think, a, a, no, I think it's a Syrian king too. Which, which one do you think is the king in this picture? Here's one there. There's a guy there. There's somebody there. There's someone here, someone here, someone here. Anybody? Who's going to pick out the king in this picture? Who do you, you think the one there? Who do you think? Um, that one. Yeah, this one here? Yes. Yeah. No, the other one. Oh, the other one? Okay. Anybody? Who, who do you think? That's it. Why, why did you choose him? He's in the most royal coat, and everyone's facing who? This one guy, right? They're all facing this way, or they're facing... How about this guy? What's he doing? Yeah. He's, he's well, he's, he's praising the king, right? He's, he's kneeling down before the king. Did, did you know the word worship actually just means to kneel down, to get down on the ground? And, and here's this guy who is down on the ground before the king. Why, why? Why do we do all that? If you were around kings, why would you do all that? Why would you face the king? Why would you give the king things? Why would you bow down to him? Any, any guesses why? Yeah. Because he's royalty. Oh, he's royalty. What a great truth. He, because he's the one who controls the whole kingdom. What are you going to say? And he might kill you, too. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Don't forget that, everyone. Yeah. 
He, he may, yeah, he, well, he does hold all judgment and final authority in his hands. Whatever he says about your life goes. So it sure is a good thing to show him respect. But he's also the one who protects the kingdom and sends the armies out to make sure everyone is safe. He's the one who creates the laws to make sure everybody is treated well and cared for. Uh, and and he, he makes sure people have food. And, well, you know, it's, that's why everyone is showing the king respect. Well, we're going to talk about that in big church. If you stay in, you might go out to kids' church and you could talk about it too. But we're going to talk about how God is king and how we worship him and why we worship him today. Well, it's because he cares for us. He provides for us. He protects us. He has the final judgment over our lives. And so we show him that kind of love and respect. I want you to think about that this week, that as Philip said, we meet Jesus. Well, we're actually meeting a king every single week. What does that mean about the way we approach him? Well, let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you'd help us to know who you are in our lives, that you are truly a king worthy of worship and praise and adoration that we can lay all that we have before you because you deserve it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you later.
Lori and Matt, thank you for that gift, that act of worship. Amazing. Well, we uh, begin a series in Genesis next week called Think Different. Uh, but as we transition from the summer into the fall and, and begin to gather more and more people back from vacations and we worship week to week, I thought it might be a, a helpful Sunday for us to think about worship and uh, think about why we worship and how we worship in particular, particularly thinking about what we do here on Sunday morning. The, the, you know, we, pro- we worship at home, we worship in many different places and ways, but why do we do what we do in our worship services as we are practicing them at this point? So to, to look at that, I thought we would look at what they do in heaven and compare it to what uh, we do here on earth. And so we're going to look at Revelation chapter 4 and 5 because it's one whole scene of worship packaged together. And so I'd encourage you, there's Bibles right in front of you, open it up, uh, just follow along uh, while, while I'm speaking, go back to it and, and, and use it to, as, a, as a tool to, to form how you view worship. So let's take a look at it together, chapter 4 of Revelation and chapter 5. Here's what John sees. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and peal of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was at it uh, were a sea of glass like crystals, like crystal. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who is seated on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord, O God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went 
And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain by your blood. You ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, and they're all saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might and forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask by your spirit, you would give us understanding and insight that we may not only know in our heads, but feel in our hearts and know in our soul who you are and who we are as we stand before you each and every day. We ask this to your glory as we consider this passage. Amen. So we we really are rightfully conditioned to approach God as Father, aren't we? Both in private and in public experiences we gather together. The Lord Jesus Christ himself directed us to approach God as Father. Uh, As we heard a moment ago in the prayer that he taught us to pray, the very first thing we're supposed to say is, Our Father. But in the very same breath, the very same statement, the very next thing uh, that Jesus acknowledges immediately is that God is King. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so as, as deeply as we appreciate the intimacy in which we have been ex- uh, given, the, the opportunity to, to approach God as, as Father, we, we must always, in that same breath, and with the same heart, and with the same mind, know that our Father is also a king. In fact, he's the king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's sovereign over heaven, over history, over the earth. There, there's no end to his rule. There's no one who can compare to him in regard to his power and majesty and might and glory. We love our fathers. We are grateful for our fathers. We might even celebrate our fathers. But worship is not the language we use when we approach our fathers. We worship kings. So I said to the kids, both in Hebrew and Greek, the word for worship means to bow down. Go down on your hands and knees to physically manifest the superiority of God and the king by bowing down, even kissing his feet. None of my children have yet bowed down to me and kissed my feet I have gotten a couple licks from our dog, Penny, but that's about it. We worship a king. We we publicly acknowledge who the king is, 
and who we are as we're before him. And we do it for everyone else to see. We can do it privately. It's good to do it privately. But we do it publicly, putting our bodies and everything else on display so that others might understand who that king is in our own lives, that our allegiance belongs to him, that our fidelity is his. And so here's this passage where we're brought into heaven through John's vision, chapter 4 and 5 of Revelations, all the troubles. If you know John 2 and 3, I mean, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, all the seven churches, all the trouble that they were walking through, well, it's all left behind. And with shocking clarity, John shows us through this vision what it means to worship the king. He enters through an open door. Where'd the door come from? Why a door? Well, it's because it's, it's, a, it's a palace. It's a temple. It's a throne room that he's entering into. In Hebrew, the word for temple is the same exact word for palace. You can translate it either way. Why? Because the temple is where God resides. It's his home. It's his, it is his, his residence. And, and so here, John is walking through the door of the palace and into the presence, in, into the throne room where God is shown as king. And he's ordained in this beautiful array of Rich colors in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4 and 5 and 6 re reflected of the, the valuable gems and stones that people would understand. Ah, these were of such worth and value. He's surrounded by glorious attendants who also wear crowns representing their rule and kingship, but not as high, not in the center like the throne that John sees and the one who sits upon it. Lightning and thunder shake the room. And if you read through the rest of Revelation, look up thunder and lightning, and it's always a sign of judgment that is poured out uh, upon those in which the great king is judging, God himself, the sovereign. He, he, he's sovereign. He has the right to rule, to bless, and to curse to jail, and to free. He has authority over all. And then you see this, this glassy sea. All the tumult, all the chaotic storms, which the church is just, you know, are in the midst of in chapters 2 and 3. All of it, when you get into the presence of God, it all just calms down. It all goes away. In this room, there's peace, there's light, there's rest. As he reigns over the impetuous darkness in the lower realms. As the prophet Habakkuk said, the Lord is in his temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You can picture that throne room in one moment of total silence and peace. But you can also picture it as what then begins to unfold. This amazing moment of praise and adoration. In verses 6 to 8, you see these living creatures, these, these fantastic, extraordinary creatures. Where'd they come from? Why are there these wild creatures who are present. Well, in the ancient Near East, there were, uh, the kings were often given gifts of extraordinary creatures. Uh, the, the Syrian king had this amazing zoo because people would bring them the you know, camels and elephants and, and uh, animals from far off regions and bring them before the king. Why? Well, it, it showed the extent of his kingdom. 
that it would, how far his kingdom reached out. And, and the king was kind of knowledgeable. You know, he, 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 he knew the, the most extravagant realities himself. And so here we have these four exotic creatures full of eyes front and behind, representing the king's omniscience. Eyes everywhere. He knows everything. Uh, and each of the creatures, the lion, the, the king's strength and, and, and authority and rule, the ox, the power, the, the man, the creature that looks like a man, the king's intelligence, the eagles in flight, the king's ability to go, his om, omnipresence. Do you see who this king is? And from verse 8 through the end of the next chapter, John watches as those privileged to be in that throne room and worship the great king begin to express their understanding and their appreciation and their praise for who he is. We need to take to heart what we see transpiring. In this passage, we triangle grace is an outpost of the kingdom of God. It's our duty to do the same things that we see happening in that throne room above. This is a sanctuary here. This is an extension of his palace. A room filled with ambassadors who represent the king of kings. This is filled, we're filled with subjects of the Lord God Almighty. We're citizens of heaven. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. And we gather in this place, in his presence, to worship. Well, what do we observe here? But what do we see those present uh, doing and, and thinking and believing? And let's take a look at what they do based, based on, somewhat on, on the way we've actually laid out our worship service. Uh, it's not uh, in the bulletin, but, but, but we, we have a, a sense of movement through our standard worship service. First, there is... Uh, a section of approach, approaching the king. Second, there's the highlight, the, the apex of proclamation of who the king is. And then third, it, it moves on to response. Response to the king. Approach, proclamation, response. This is Reform Presbyterian kind of idea of movement through a service, approach, proclamation, and response. The, the first component of our worship is approach. How do we approach worship? How, how do we prepare our hearts and minds to take in the full wonder of who God is? Well, we see in this passage that it actually doesn't first start in the sanctuary itself. It starts outside the sanctuary. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, John sees uh, an angel come to him and say, come up here. Uh, come in to the presence of the Lord. Come and see the Lord. The door is open. See his plans. See his power. See how redemptive history shall one day reach its consummation. Come and see John. See where you fit in to what God is doing. You see this sort of delightful eagerness. Oh, come on in. We, it, our act of worship begins when we believe that there's something to invite other people into seeing. It, it's, it, we're talking about a culture of invitation. You, you see the invitation that is present. That there's something so arresting, so compelling, that we open the door, invite our neighbors and friends into the house of God to witness his greatness. 
as we drive to church each week? Is that how we're thinking about God? Throughout the week, are we thinking, we've got to get my friend here to see the glory and nature of this great king? Our approach to worship is corporate in nature. 24 elders were uh, clothed in white and, and, and highlighted their living creatures there. A little later it says all of the angels who were present. Revelation 7, there's another scene of worship. And it says that there's multitudes that no one could count from every tribe and nation that surround the throne. And so when we walk through the door and approach worship, what a delight it is to see each other. Do you know how important you are? Not only to God, but to each other. As, as a reminder that God is working today in our lives, in history, so much so that we want to gather together. So we hug each other when we see each other. We shake each other's hands. We smile. We rejoice. We're glad children are here. We're glad our seniors are here. We're glad those who are weary and beaten down all week long were willing to still say, I believe in the God who will deliver me and gather here as his people to worship and enjoy his presence. We also remind ourselves that we come into the worship by just making a statement at the beginning of the service. We, we have this uh, thing we call a call to worship. We, verse 8, actually, we see the same kind of thing. The living creatures, it says, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. At no moment do they ever forget who he is. We do. As the week unfolds, this world is like a fog, and we get lost in it, and we grope, and we're weighted down. And so we walk into this sanctuary, and some of you, I'd encourage all of you to do this. It's, it's wonderful to, to greet each other and rejoice in the corporate nature of our worship, but it may be good to sit and just be quiet for a second. And center yourself. But the first act of worship corporately, we stand up and we call each other to worship. We use psalms, we use uh, prophets' words. Today we used uh, the words of, of um, uh, Revelation. We make sure that we remind ourselves who God is as we enter into his sanctuary. And we do that through song. We always open up with a, a song together. That's how the, the Israelites always approached the temple for festivals. They would go up to Jerusalem. They'd go up to the temple and they would sing psalms. There's a particular set of psalms, the psalms of ascent, they're called. They, they were sung as they approached God in his holy temple. So we do the same. We sing a song to start the service out. We follow with a, a prayer of adoration, acknowledging to God himself. We're telling God, we know who you are. We've already told each other we remember who he is. Now we're telling God, we know who you are as we sing and we enter into this time of prayer. We have recently uh, move the, the, the creed, the creedal statement. It, it probably feels like foreign to you. Wait, wait we, the creed is a part of the prayer? Uh, you know, the creed is just the creed. Yeah. Well, it is. Uh, yeah, creed is a creed. But we're using the creed not only to remind each other of who God is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but we're also saying we are saying this before his throne. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we know who you are. And so we've incorporated the creed into our uh, time of approach, way of approach, the life of the church. It's not supposed to be an announcement 
where we tell you about what things are coming up. Although we, you know, we pray, uh, we, we do that. We, we let people know, you know this is happening. But really behind the idea of the life of the church is to allow not only for biblical testimony of God's work in our lives, but in, you know, about what he did in Moses' day or in Paul's day, but to actually say God is alive and he's doing things among us now. He's drawing us together into deeper relationship. He's brought us to faith. Uh, when we baptize uh, a child, how we, we know he's present in, in the family's life or someone who comes to faith, uh, offers a testimony of the new members, uh, covenant partners, as they express, we believe in God. It's all meant as a way to approach God's presence to affirm that we understand who he is as we come before him. Well, the second movement in our worship service is then proclamation. It's the pinnacle moment of, of, of this worship scene we see in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, right? It, if you take a look at it again, all attention is given to a scroll. Clearly, the content of it is immeasurable in value because every single Creature, angel, people who are there want to know, want to see. They long to, to hear what is in that scroll proclaimed and actuated. But what happens? There's this jarring moment of grief. There's weeping. John weeps. Why does it do that? Well, what's, what is this scroll? The scroll, it represents the sovereign, sovereign plan and rule of God to bring about all that he planned to bring about. When he created the world, it was supposed to be brought about through the work and, uh, of Adam and Eve and humanity behind. It was all supposed to happen in a certain way. And it didn't. Because of sin, because of, of failure to obey the king, humanity forfeited the right to participate in that plan. And so here John is, full of sorrow. He's, it's a confession of sin, a confession of his own helplessness, the helplessness of every other creature under heaven before God as they have become subjects of the powers and principalities of this world rather than the reign of God over them. And so before we get to proclamation, we do the same thing every week. We, we, we have a moment of confession. We, we express to the Lord our helplessness and our sorrow before him for what we've done, the grievous nature of our disobedience that deserves the judgment and wrath of those thunderbolts. Ah, but there's peace and there's pardon. And regardless of John's sin or our sin, we still have the opportunity to see and hear this truth. So we extend, extend the peace to one another to affirm that we are okay in God's presence. And we don't have to fear his judgment now because of what Christ has done, because of what the, uh, the Lamb has done for us. And so we reach this moment of proclamation. Where, where the contents of the scripture of, of the scroll is the second movement of worship from approach to proclamation, and we find out that no one can open this scroll but Christ Himself. And so, in every one of our worship services, we beg God to help us to understand not from our own intellect, but by the mind of Christ, the truth that is revealed in our scroll as we open it up and study it and think about it together. We ask 
that the Spirit of Christ might give us understanding for these majestic truths. And then the pro proclamation comes. The great Scottish reformer, Presbyterian, really founder, John Knox, he said, I never once feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter the pulpit. The weight of, of glory in proclamation is a tremendous weight to bear, both for the preacher and for the congregation. To speak in a manner worthy of the truth proclaimed, to listen and receive such truth in in a way that's worthy of the majesty of the truth that we hear. Who's up for this task? Who, who can stand and speak on behalf of God? Who has ears to hear by themselves? When I preach, and I know Joe and Jeff and Molly feel the same way. When we preach, we know how we fail every single time. Because we're not worthy of this task. And I have to tell you, when I sit in the pew and I listen to sermons, the proclamation I also know how much I fail. I end up so often, rather than being judged and shaped by that proclamation, I end up judging the proclamation itself. Oh, none of us, whether preaching or listening, are worthy of the gift of the scroll that we have been entrusted. But John is told, do not weep. What's the center of the proclamation? Why does he not have to weep? Verse 9 and 10 says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. It, what is the content of the scroll? How does it understood? It's Christ. It's the redemptive work of Christ. He is the thread that brings all of the pages of the scroll, the book, together. Every dot, every tittle of scripture from Genesis to Revelation points to Christ, is fulfilled in Christ as the ex exaltation of the lamb that was slain, the, that has purchased us as his own and gives us the right to stand before him and to reign with him in glory. That's what it's all about. He is whom it is all about. If you leave a worship service in which you have not heard the person of Jesus Christ exalted above all other names, you have not been to a worship service. As the prayer of St. Patrick says, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my light, left, Christ leaps off of every page of Scripture and into our hearts. The last movement in our worship then is a movement to response. As the scroll is taken by the Lamb, it says in verse 8 
of chapter 5 that the living creatures and the elders fell down before the Lamb. That again was an, an action of surrender. They laid a harp before him. They laid a bowl of incense before him. And we're told that that bowl of incense is uh, the prayers of the people. Prayers of the saints. That's followed with a new song that is sung according to those verses. So prayers are offered. Songs are sung. Well, that's what we do. After the proclamation... We continue to worship with greater passion and fervor because we are reminded again of his glorious nature. Back in verse 4, when the four living creatures proclaimed the holiness of God, the elders also fell down before the throne. This time it says they took their crowns off and laid them before the king, everything they had, the greatest value that they possessed at that moment, they laid it down, surrendered to God visually, audibly, with body and voice. They responded to his goodness and grace, manifesting their very dependence upon him. And so in, in, in the last portion uh, of, of our service, we do all of these things. We sing songs. We offer bowls and prayers. We, uh, we, we have the Lord's Supper like we'll have in a moment as a means to celebrate what God has done through Christ, the slain rant, lamb who gives us life. You know, and since 2020, we haven't taken an offering. You know, we used to pass the plates uh, back and forth and and we, we did that because there were health risks we felt involved in doing that. And, and then when COVID issues began to pass, we've actually been talking a lot as, as it's the staff and the elders. Well, so many people are giving online now. So do we need to do an offering in the service now? Or, uh, or so, uh, others... You feel like sometimes it just makes visitors a little uncomfortable when the plate has to pass in front of them. And a, and a theological argument, some said, well, look, we're supposed to not sh show others what uh, you give or anything like that. Keep it to yourself. Keep it quiet. And, and, and that's true. It, it, that's in the scripture. But then you have in Deuteronomy 16, when Israel comes before the Lord, do you remember what it says? When they come up for the festival three times a year, they are commanded. It says, do not come before the Lord empty-handed. Why? Well, why can't you come before the Lord empty-handed? Well, because taking that crown off or offering something that's physical and tangible says you're in the game. You, you are giving of not just words but your very dear belongings to the king and so you know we've, we've kind of struggled about this back and forth that you know, it, there's directives to do this as an act of so we've we've decided we're, we're going to bring back a time of physical offering in our services we're going to start next week and you'll, you'll see how that kind of unfolds but in this response, it's all about actually responding to God. Vocally, physically, sacrificially. And a response to God to, to give him all that we have and all that we are to offer him these things. It, it's something that continues on once we leave here. We continue to worship by serving him. Worship extends throughout the week. And so as our service ends, we offer a blessing, a benediction, a good word, a reminder that as you're leaving this place, God is with you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. You continue to serve him faithfully, 
from morning to sunset each day until we gather again. The book of Revelation ends with a benediction. Revelation 22, 6 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with his people. Amen. Every Sunday, the door is open. There's an invitation extend, extended to each of us to gather to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's not so much the structure that is you know, super important, though you know, we, we want these aspects to be a part of our worship. But it, it's really the heart of worship that we witness in this passage that's paramount. The worship we witness is not about the living creatures. The worship we witness isn't about the elders or the angels. It is about the king and who he is. It's a worship that is authentic. It's passionate. It's all in worship. It's heartfelt worship. They really believe he is who they say he is. They really believe the scroll to actually represent the movement of history that they long to see unfold. So they bow down humbly, joyfully, with thanksgiving, amazed, deeply moved. And may we do the same week in and week out as we gather together, standing, waving hands, kneeling, whatever your heart is moved to do, giving to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Let's pray, Lord, we ask that you would give us the same heart of worship, that in all ways we would acknowledge you as our Lord and King through our voice, through our prayers, through our proclamation, through our response, through our giving. It all belongs to you, Lord. And so we worship you this day and every day until we see you face to face. Amen. Let's stand together and sing holy, holy, holy.
with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. And so with your people on earth and all the company in heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As we prepare for this solemn meal, let us join together saying the Apostles' Creed with Christians from all times and ages. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, Please be seated. Scripture tells us that if we claim that we are without sin, we are liars and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us confess our sins together using the inspired words of Psalm 51, found in your bulletin. Have, Have mercy, mercy on me, me O God, God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen. This meal is open to all who have professed a faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of church membership or denominational affiliation. Uh, but I do know we have guests among us. If you're uncomfortable uh, eating of this meal, of what we have shared today is really not where your heart is. Don't feel any social pressure to participate uh, as we eat together, uh, reminding ourselves of our vows of covenant, love, and loyalty to Christ uh, and his church. Just use this time uh, instead as a time of reflection. Uh, I, for those among us who are taking, I want to remind you we'll take communion in the pews this day, and uh, bread will be brought out to you. Hold on to the bread and we'll take that bread together as a reminder of our unity uh, we have in Christ. As the bread passes by, you might want to say to the person, if you're comfortable saying it, the body of Christ broken for you. There is a gluten-free option that's available. Just raise your hand and you can receive that 
uh, as well. When the cup is offered, uh, just take it individually because it represents, uh, as you do, that Christ died for you, for your sins personally. Uh, again, you may want to say to the person next to you, the blood of Christ shed for you if you're comfortable doing that. And uh, you can put cups into the pew uh, when we're finished. Let's pray this prayer together. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, your forgiveness and presence that we may partake in this sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in newness of life, may grow into his likeness, and may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread is an emblem of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, who through his life of perfect obedience secured our righteousness and through his death secured for us the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
is that after the disciples finished eating the Last Supper with Jesus, that they went out and sang a hymn together. So let's join our voices together and sing the doxology. Would you stand with me? We'll sing it a cappella. And if you're willing, would you reach out to the person around you or either side and hold their hands to symbolize the unity we have in Jesus Christ? And let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you're in need of prayer for any reason, there'll be some folks up here that consider it a great privilege to pray with you. There's time of fellowship afterwards. Extend this love feast into the fellowship hall and then come to my house, Laura's house, at 5 p.m. and we'll keep on eating all day long. Now receive the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Be with all of God's people, which is you. Amen.